my main priority is obviously to, to create shareholder value and that's my number one responsibility. But one of the things I have to do in order to create shareholder value and growth is to make sure that the team remains the best team in the world to do the job we've been given. Hi everyone and welcome back to a new episode of the World Class Leader Show. In today's episode, I have with me uh, someone that I think is going to really inspire you. So it's Talal Shamoon and Talal is the Intertrust CEO and he became CEO in 2003, so many years as a CEO. Under his leadership, Intertrust has grown from a small R&D company to a global leader in trusted computing products and services, licensing and standardization. Intertrust is a company that um, is based in Silicon Valley and its inventions enable billions of licensed products worldwide. Its products are globally deployed. About Talal, he joined Intertrust, as we said a long time ago, I think 97, as a member of the research staff and then held a series of executive positions from executive vice presidents, now as a CEO. He's an electrical engineer, computer scientist by training. He was a researcher at NEC Research Institute in Princeton, where he focused on digital sign, signal, signal sorry, processing and content security. He sits also on several company boards and is a recognized inventor, published author, and frequent public speaker with a PhD degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University. So Talal, thank you so, for being on the show today. Oh, Andrea, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Talal was recommended by a good friend of mine, so a managing director of International uh, Ventures, Andreas Berger, was also on the show last year, so feel free to go back and look at the previous episodes. So, Talal, the first question, just to break the ice a bit and, uh, you know, also for the audience to understand a little bit more about you, you have been, as far as I understand, you know, with, with the same company for so many years, which is kind of... Uh, array things these days right when people they used to you know to change jobs to move from one company to another so what has been the secret to stay so long in one single company and become a ceo at some point that, that, that that's a great question it, it's uh you know sometimes i joke like i'm the longest serving dictator in a banana republic but um <laughs> it, i mean that's a bad joke but the uh people in the valley especially in silicon valley yeah you know, the name of the game is to to sort of hop, skip, and jump and go from company to company. I've been at the same company now for 25 plus years. Um, and I think the reason is that it, it's, it's the nature of the company more than my personality. The company itself has changed forms uh, mm. repeatedly over time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ever young company which is constantly exploring different go-to-market strategies, different ways to monetize what we do. The other thing, and I I don't have obviously a web link to this, but you can Google Intertrust uh, and the the name of the reporter, Stephen Lohr, Steve Lohr at the New York Times. Hmm. He wrote uh, an article in ah, like 2003 or four, I forget. The title was "A Silicon Valley Reboots: The Geeks Takes Over." All right, and, yes. Um, it was about you know this was right after dot com and um, it, things were, were coming back as as things happen in the valley and we're beginning to see that right now and we had the 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 post COVID crash and now all of a sudden you start seeing the the seed the the sprouts of, of new companies being formed, new companies being funded. We're entering a, a, a new era of growth in the valley, but in 2003, you know, Steve did the showcase on three companies. Uh, it was Intertrust, uh, VMware, which was still uh, a, a oh, youngish right. company yeah. back then, and it was a voiceover IP company that had been acquired by Microsoft or became acquired by Microsoft. But anyway, he he interviewed me, and and what I what I pointed out to him was. Silicon Valley is not so much about the company or the idea. It's about the team that works together. And what you usually see is a troop forming of you know people who like each other, have very complementary skills, who trust each other. They almost become a family. Yes. And they move into shells. And then when they deplete the shell, whether it succeeds or fails, they move on to the next one, next one, next one. But the thing you have to analyze is really the group of people. And what usually happens is the group of people will like 
there will there'll always be a core that stay together, but there are people on the fringes that try something different, but then come back. And we've experienced that at Intertrust. People will leave and then come back. But for me, there's a core group of people around me. We've worked together for 20, 25 years. Um, what we keep and, and what we were given by the founder of the company, I'm not the founder, was this fabric to paint on that's just immortal. And, it, you know, he invented this entire field of distributed trusted computing. And he set up a legacy where the company could keep itself young by continuing to do research and generate new intellectual property. The original idea was so big that it really impacts the entire internet. And mm. it's a lifetime's work, right? And yes. the basic idea of InterTrust is the internet is about interoperability. That's what the internet protocol enabled. But in the original design of the internet in the 1970s, there was a flaw, not really a flaw, but a requirement that was non-existent, which is there was no trust. And the reason there was no trust was the trust model, as they say, was the internet would be used by the military. Mm. And the main requirement was to build a communication network for the military that was resilient to a nuclear attack. So you couldn't have centralized infrastructure. So it was completely decentralized. And um, what they did was they built this thing. It was brilliant. It just, you know, completely decentralized distribution. It opened the field of distributed computing, distributed operating system, distributed networks, as we know. But yes. the threat model, because it was a military network, was the enemy was on the outside mm -hmm. and the good guys were on the inside. So when the enemy came near the computer, you shoot them. Now, <laughs> one of the biggest happy accidents in the history of technology is no one said this is only for the military. And then in the 1980s and 1990s, people started using the Internet for general communication. And it was an open network that couldn't be defended because it was everywhere at the same time. You didn't know who yeah. used it. Yes. So all of a sudden, the human beings had this interoperable communication medium that was fantastic that you could do digital with. But there was there's no trust because you didn't know who was on the network. It's not like in the army. But anyway, so Victor Shear, the founder of Intertrust, he looked yeah. at this thing and he said, okay, you can't protect the computing device because you don't yes. know who's using it and you can't protect the network. So he designed an operating system where the trust, which was management and security of the information, was in the operating system in software or maybe defended by hardware as well. Mm -hmm. which, Authentication was done contextually, and that's the company. Now, I joined, as you said, my background is in signal processing. I'm sort of audio video guy, right? And my, yes. my inventive work was in the area of digital watermarking and audio data compression. When I joined the company, I mean, these guys were super visionary, right? It's like, what are we going to do? And they're like, oh, we're going to revolutionize all computing and da, 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 this phones and consumer electronics and insurance and healthcare. And but I was like, where do we start? I'm like, oh, good question. Well, it turns out the entertainment business is an early adopter of all of these types of disruptive technology. And if you remember in 1997, MP3 was destroying the music industry. So I was like, I know something about music. Uh, let's go talk to the music business. And that became digital rights management. And that also became, um, that also became, you know, audio protection, eventually the technologies that are used by Microsoft, right. Apple, all of that. But then we had this very lucky moment where audio goes to video easily, but then you go from PCs playing music to consumer devices playing music to mobile phones playing music. We ended, ended up in the mobile space and it turned out we had inventions on app stores because you know the idea that an app store is just sitting there open, okay, hello, malware. So the security of app stores basically came from us. Could we pause just to let this guy out? Otherwise, yeah. I have to see real editing. So, you know, we end up in mobility and we end up, you know, taking our inventions in the mobile space. And there you have, you know, even more capabilities that are much more generic. So that was the second phase. And then finally, the last five years has been really exciting because we broke out from entertainment and media started targeting the energy space because this is the the really hot market right now that's adopting these technologies and we're playing a major role in providing digital interoperability and security for the energy industry which if my thesis works 
we follow the electrons. And then right. you follow the electrons, you end up in electric cars, you end up in, in everything you care about. So that really propagates this over the entire internet. So the reason I haven't left the company is every chapter is new. Every chapter is exciting. Every chapter is a challenge that no one else has solved. We have a very dedicated team who love working together. New people join, some stay, some don't. We meet new investors who are fantastic, how I met Andreas. Um, we meet new customers and new partners, but we still keep the old stuff. I mean, we're we're the most deployed digital rights management technology in the world. And our technology is used in Europe, it's used in China, it's used in India, it's used all over the world. Right. So it's been a fun ride, basically. Yeah, so what I, you know, what I'm hearing essentially is this is a company that has been always very keen to stay flexible, to stay true to what you're doing, but essentially flexible to address different challenges and also work in different markets. And now you have seen opportunity energy and that's where you're moving more. So I think it's a typical in the spirit of right of Silicon Valley, be able to agile, flexible, also from a strategic perspective, you know, moving in different areas. And you mentioned a little bit before so now that we you know we start talking a little bit more about the company about the future is it silicon valley the right place right now to keep you know stay focused on innovation um to be really at the top of you know all the new discoveries or you think the environment right now the silicon valley is not because you know we're reading a lot of things about you know many companies or leaders leaving the valleys and moving other direction moving different sectors etc or in different areas is still silicon valley in other words so critical important for driving the level of innovation not only in in the you know in in the internet business but generally speaking in technology is that the right place for intertrust as well in terms of the future to stay and to thrive uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, uh, and I can explain why. The longer answer is Silicon Valley is a state of mind, and no one has a monopoly on innovation. Right. So just to say, right, this is it. You know, that's that's uh, that's unfair and it's arrogant. But the comparison I draw is this is Silicon Valley is like Florence in the Renaissance. Mm. I mean. It, you know, it's hard to find, you know, a Michelangelo in every city and it's hard to find. But was Florence the only place where people were painting and sculpting and writing and reading and think? No, the whole of Europe was alive in the Renaissance. Venice had its thing. Milan had its thing. Um, there was innovation and growth like the journey you know, what became Germany. I mean, the seeds of capitalism were being sown as people were moving. So. That's happening across the planet. And I think a lot of it is being inspired by Silicon Valley. Uh, the global communication system that we've developed, the way we've learned to work during COVID is allowing the sort of virtualization of innovation. So it's less place related and much more space related. Um, yeah. But there's, I mean, this is one of the, I don't know the plural of nexus, nexus is nexi. Of, of innovation on the planet. It's going to be like this forever. It's it's a it's a blessed place, the climate, the topology of the bay, but the presence of two major universities, all of the money that funds uh innovation, the American system's ability to ingest people from any place in the world, being halfway between Japan, China, Korea, and Europe. And, you know, having great connectivity to places like India, there's no question. I mean, this is ground zero. On the other hand, I, I read an article last week in The Guardian uh, about Eindhoven in Holland, right, which is a town I have mm. a special place yep. in my heart for. And, you know, Philips has been a long time, very dedicated shareholder of Intertrust and a, a true partner. I mean, Eindhoven is unbelievable. I mean, invention per capita exceeds Palo Alto. I mean, no question. I mean, and but you have the same seeds. You have, um, you have uh, a great university. You have Philips. You have all the spinoffs from Philips. You have the Dutch, who are very, very entrepreneurial people, going back centuries. And you can drive or or take a train to, you know, every major Western European city you care about. 
Um, there's something in the soil there that that really breeds innovation. There's other, you know, Helsinki, for example, is a similar phenomenon, right? The, you know, it's not Philips, it's Nokia. So there are other places um, around the planet that have this chemistry. But I mean, this is really the capital of innovation. I mean, okay. there's no question. Right. Right. So let's shift a little bit the conversation about you as a CEO, right? So what is your major learning, I would say, from being, you know, one of the employees and then you really, you, you know, you climb, right, the corporate ladder, you know, until the point that you became a CEO. How changed your perspective about working for a company? So, you know, moving the wraps, sorry, moving up the ranks. Why sometimes, you know, we see CEOs moving from one company to another, so they, they need to inherit and someone else's team, they don't necessarily know the culture, they need to change things. So wasn't, in other words, wasn't easy, you know, transition for you because you have been in a company or when you became a CEO, things changed and you play a completely different game? Um, my answer is going to be very unconventional because the, I do see a lot of people who have the title CEO who, I mean, you don't go to college and major in yeah. being a CEO, but they're kind of professional managers basically and they're playing the game they have a bag of value they add you know in big companies you know there's you know interacting with stock markets interacting with complex management team and you know interacting with the government in some cases that's a special skill set um in venture capital situations a lot of times they're looking for a person who can take a company from level a to level b and maybe they go to C and D, maybe they don't, they leave, they bring in other people. Uh, there are turnaround people, specialists, there are growth specialists, et cetera, and so forth. Intertrust proper and me are a strange animal because, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur by nature. I, I worked in a big company at the beginning of my career. That was just not for me. And the idea, you know, the guy passed away a couple of years ago, but the head of the place I worked, the institute I worked, after I had a fight with my manager, um, came to me and he said, you know, I was in the army and in the army, you learn to salute the uniform, not the person wearing the uniform and you have to go hmm. apologize. Hmm. That was the minute I decided to leave big companies. I mean, it was right. like, okay, the guy's an idiot and I don't respect him. Why the hell should I, you know, we got into a fight for a good reason. I'm leaving. Right. And this company is an incredible phenomenon. It's very, very rare because, it's it's just it's been evergreen throughout its life and it it it's almost like a phoenix and a chameleon had a child right it it mm. it, it, it get, we get into these situations where we drive a major disruptive cycle you know taking on big companies i mean we fought microsoft we fought you know apple at different times we are on the radar at like the major platform companies but you know, whatever happens, happens. We survive and we grow. And then we reincarnate ourselves like in a new state. That's right. phenomenally rare, but it's also phenomenally exciting. And it's been like this since I joined. I mean, Victor is, you know, larger. He's retired. But he's larger than life. And always, you know, the company's always had a very flat structure. There's there's no real hierarchy. We We organize around, you know, problems that need to be solved. So a lot of times I'll be getting directions from you know people who officially report to me in the org chart because they're the subject matter expert. I'm there to help them. Um, and that's I've set it up that way. I've set it up to be much more dynamic and less tree structured and more graph structured. Yes. So we can be highly adaptive. Um, so it, 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 it's funny. I, I don't recall like a change in my outlook at any point in my time at this company. My responsibilities have changed. And, you know, the my main priority is obviously to to create shareholder value. And that's my number one responsibility. But one of the things I have to do in order to create shareholder value and growth is to make sure that the team remains the best team in the world to do the job we've been given. And that involves, you know, you know, protecting, you know, their careers and helping them grow and watching them closely and making sure the right person is doing the right job at the right time, that people are playing nice with each other. The response, the set of responsibilities has changed as I've transitioned, but mm. it, it, I have the same sense of ownership for the company today that I had the day I joined because it's, oh, you know, it's, a small, it's a small company, 
And how many employees are right now? We're on 110, 120 employees. We've been as big as four or 500. We're not very good at being bigger than about 150. Okay. Right. It's, it's, so what's going to happen if you need to then scale and grow? So you're going to stop or, well, you're saying that, but that's interesting. Well, I mean, we've overgrown in the past deliberately and we've overgrown by mistake and we've had to take corrective action. Right. Uh, That includes, you know, we've had some successes. I mean, we, we had a division that was hyper focused on a market niche, um, a company called White Cryption that was started in Riga, which, by the way, is, a, is another major innovation hub. You know, the whole Baltic area. Yeah, definitely. We just, we just got to a point with White Cryption where what they were doing was super cool. They were a world leader, but they weren't that simpatico to the rest of the product line per se. So we sold it. And we gave the people of White Christian a great career path. We partnered with a company that bought it. It's called Zimperium. Fantastic company. Um, so we overgrow. There's all this. I mean, have you ever read The Tipping Point? By, I mean, a lot of people have by Malcolm Gladwell. It, it's a mm-hmm. it's a great book. You can read it very quickly. Yeah, yeah. There's, a whole chap- there's a whole chapter in there on, on optimum organization size. And he looks at the military. And it's like, there's a reason that you have platoons, companies, divisions, you know, that kind of thing. They're all a certain size. It's to maintain uh, communication and effectiveness and leadership, but also to ensure scalability. Um, there's one, the, the, the example in that section of the book is Gore-Tex, the, the company that invented this yep. waterproof fabric. The guy who founded Gore-Tex, I think his name was Gore, actually. That's where the name comes from. Um, he... Uh, Every time the company hit 150, like he, li- I mean, and this was very inspiring to me, actually. He, every time the thing hits 150, he sets up a new division and he got so obsessed with it. It's been years since I read the book, but I think they would open, they would rent office buildings that could only support X people. And they would have only so many parking spaces and everybody had an equal size office. And, you know, he, the same philosophy I have, which is you team around tasks and problems you don't create a hierarchy and then all of a sudden people start to optimize based on the uniform they're wearing not the job they're doing and uh, and that's when normally happen you know job creation where people that they, they try to fill the gap because they are there rather than bringing value right so no, no, that's no. unfortunate when they grow that's very right. fast so that you know again if you know when we grow over 150 that's where the red light starts to blink on my desk about okay you're doing something that's oh, not natural for us so and I, I have to start watching closely how to manage it. Right. Uh, that's interesting. Is it one of your challenges? So, is, so, so my next question is, what are the challenges that CEO like you, Talal, has right now? So, you know, besides the conventional, you know, challenges of growing, you know, and scaling, funding talents, people, you know, setting strategies. So besides the conventional, right? Because all the CEOs dealing with this, is there anything a little bit, you know, a deeper level that concerns a CEO like you. I mean, I mean, of course, share what you can share, what you want to share. You know, I, I don't mean to ask something very private or very or confidential, of course. I want to just say, what are a typical CEO of a company like, like yours has in order to keep building value, you know, for, for the shareholders? This, I mean, I'll, I'll speak generically. The... I think this comes from my background as a scientist, like which you know, I left mm. the science zoo like 25 years ago. It's like, yeah. but the it, it in in research you're trained to find the biggest open problem that no one else has solved and throw yourself at it in, in the hope of making a major breakthrough. And one of the reasons I resonated with the this company and the founder of this company when I met him was he did the same thing and just, you know, I'm talking a lot about him, but he's really one of my heroes. His father was one of the co-inventors of chemotherapy. He was a very famous doctor. Um, he founded the National Cancer Institute in Washington, you know, started at Harvard with David Farber, who's the father of chemotherapy. And, you know, and, and Victor sort of grew up in this world where you found the biggest open problem and you punched it in the face. Right. And, for me, the cool part, because I was always like a little bit mm-hmm. personality. I, I like, I like the science and research, but I also just really have a business gene. And, you know, I, I love the business world because 
the optimizing criteria is very simple. It's, you know, make shareholder value grow. I mean, it's not like, oh, discover the sound of the big bang, you know, this kind of thing. That's much more esoteric for me. And I'm just, I was just <laughs> more effective as a business person than I was as a scientist. So the biggest sort of metaphysical challenge we have is as a company, we bite off these huge problems and it, it's like landing on a new planet. Mm. And trying to, you know, terraform or civilize it, right? And, you know, when I remember when we first met with the record labels, I mean, Universal and BMG got it. They knew that the CD was dead and they had to move on to this internet thing. It was existential. Mm -hmm. But the other three record labels were, weren't so sure. And I, I won't name the guy, but I was in a meeting in New York with... Uh, the heads of technology for all of the five labels at the time. And one of them said, a CD is 600 megabytes. You can't transfer a CD uh, over a modem. Right? Remember, it's 56.6. I remember the, the number. Exactly I, was right. like, <laughs> I was like, what do you, what, what, what do you read? What do you watch? I mean, MP3 compresses a CD by an order of magnitude and these modems are getting faster, you know, it's like, and then of course, three years later, boom, you know, the Titanic mm -hmm. sank, right? The, the Titanic being the CD. That was very quick, to be frank. I mean, we started talking to these guys in late 97. By 1999, Intertrust, Universal, BMG, and a few other companies launched the world's first digital music distribution system on the internet. Right. And we can talk a little bit about that and, and what it was. But I mean, one of the things in innovation, and this is a great analogy from this guy I, I heard give a lecture in, in the 1980s when I was a student. He said he was a neural networks expert. And he said, you know, when people started to build airplanes, the only thing they knew that flies were birds. So they looked at birds and birds had feathers and birds had wings that move. And, you know, and so the first airplanes, you, you see these pictures like the they had these yes. airplanes yes. where, yes. The, you know, and they had feathers on some, it's like, and he goes, at some point they figured out, okay, you just need a wing and an engine or some, some motor and that was it. And he, his analogy was, okay, this is where we are in 1988 with neural networks. But, you know, the, the first digital music distribution system we built, you know, had feathers and flapping wings and blah, blah, but it set the template. And two years later, Steve Jobs launched the iPod and iTunes. So that happened in very quick succession. The mobile wars played out over a much longer time period uh, that we were involved in. And the reason for that was the jump from your Nokia 6000 series mm -hmm. T9 keyboard to ringtones to feature phones to smartphones just took longer. And Generations of companies like Nokia, Motorola had to die for companies like Apple and Samsung to be born, right? Um, but we played a key role in all of that. And then what do we do, right? Energy. We started thinking about energy in 2010, doing research in this area. And we had a project that was codenamed Grid Ball, Grid Eyeball, that was basically like, hey, things at the endpoint of an energy system are going to talk to generators and we can apply AI. And so that was, you know, we, we were doing research on this in 2010. Yes. Because we saw the IOT, we saw big data processing. We have all this experience with media. These things are just very similar in the end to what happens when your TV wakes up and calls up BT and you want to watch, you know, a soccer game or something. It, it's, it's a similar, from our point of view, a similar effect. So, I mean, you go to the energy industry and they're, they haven't, they're not digital people, right? So you walk this road with them as partners. And so my biggest, my biggest challenge is managing growth uh, in these new industries. We're, we're betting it all right now on breaking out in a brand new vertical market. And it, if we succeed, it's going to be huge. But we went back to the future. I mean, we mm -hmm. could have very easily stayed in our comfort zone. Uh, you know, we, we started officially this path into the energy space in 2015, 2016. We could have very easily stayed in our comfort zone in consumer electronics, licensing RIP, mobile, 
you know, running small product services for media technology, doing venture capital, which is what we were doing in the mid 2000s. I mean, Nest Labs, the thermostat company that Google bought for three billion, started in our office in a in a borrowed conference room. But I believe in the I believe in the vision of this company. I believe that the internet has to be made trusted. And that's really the, whether it's me or somebody else doing it, that's really the mission of this company. So we decided if you revolutionize energy and you give people the power of digital energy management, that will penetrate, that will proliferate over the entire planet, over the entire IOT. And we can sew it all together. We have to do this, right? So my biggest challenge is basically staying afloat while we drive this major, super ambitious transition. And this is the most ambitious transition in the 30 year history of the company. That's what keeps me up at night. Right. How are you driving this in front of your people? So, I mean, you know, when people, I mean, of, of course, I, I can understand that a company like Intertrust, given the space where you are, but also the business that you are in the history of the, of the business, it's very natural for people to be flexible, to be agile, move into a different direction and go all in, in a new idea, a new vision that you are building. Is that so easy as you are representing right now, bringing all people with you? Is it people are, you know, are really, because you said people are everything for me and the quality of the team that we have, et cetera. How are you able to drive people in building, you know, a new future from one point to another? Because people that might face like, oh, we're going to change again. Oh, we might face challenges in front of us. I'm not sure we're going to do it. So. Is it part of your leadership, you know, essentially bringing the people with you and make sure that, that your vision stick with them? It's job number one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from from a, from my management point of view, it's job number one. Uh, I mean, my answer to your question is it's easy if you have the right team. So the question is, how do you have the right team? The other one is there's you probably have this saying in Italian. The, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. So. <laughs> Yes. The one thing I learned as an electrical engineer that's helped me throughout my non-electrical engineering career is if you have a very difficult mathematical problem, you can probably find a transformation of the equation that puts it in a different domain that makes it easier to solve. Yes. And yes. we are all about, you know, pretty much one thing, which is protecting and managing data and information as it travels between different parties and allowing people to build digital value chains. Yeah. And what that really requires you to do is to authenticate people and hardware to services and vice versa, and then provide protected processing environments for the computation to take place. Very simple. And what we're doing right now, actually, is kind of cool is the team that built all of our technology that's running in, I lose count, a few billion TV set-top boxes, mobile phones, not just for video protection, but also for just, hey, I'm a set-top box, trust me, or I'm a mobile phone, trust me. That's you know, We do it all over the planet. That yes. same team is developing the code for energy systems. So when a heat pump wakes up in Germany and says, I'm a heat pump, you know, can I tell you what I need? And you can tell us, it's the same. It's the same theory. And, you know, obviously... The requirements are more because, okay, somebody hacks your set-top box, tough shit, you don't watch Netflix. Somebody hacks your heat pump and 3 million heat pumps in your country as part of a cyber attack on the coldest day of the year, you've got real problems. But guess what? We have national security experts on our team who can solve those problems. So we've transformed what we perceive to be the biggest challenge business-wise, which is to provide interoperability securely in business ecosystems where you have competitors who have to cooperate. Right. So you know, the transformer makers hate each other. The heat pump makers hate each other. The power company doesn't care. When I buy you know, a transformer, I want to get the best transformer for the price. I don't care if it's from Schneider or ABB. It just has to work. And when I'm building a virtual power plant or an energy as a service system, I want to have an ecosystem of devices that when they wake up digitally and phone home and allow me to control them, I have to be able to trust them. And I don't care if Wiesmann hates Bosch and they compete and it's like, that's their problem. So we 
we literally sell solutions that allow competitors to cooperate without needing to collaborate. And yeah. that's a problem we've solved in media and mobile. And it's easy to solve in energy as long as everybody has the right mentality. And we have these very specialized tools to do it. Um, that's the fun part of this. It's it's a new yes. puzzle and it has to be solved. And trust me, executives in the energy business are very different than executives in a film studio. And, uh, you know, well, uh... it's a challenge. And, and by the way, going back to the earlier question about you know, Silicon Valley, the best and all this stuff. Sure, it's the Florence of innovation in this era. On the other hand, this company is super international. We have a core team here. But we have more employees outside the United States and outside Silicon Valley than we do in Silicon Valley. We have a team in Tallinn and Estonia. We have a team in a big team in India um, and in several cities. We have a highly specialized skilled team in China, in Beijing, for our Chinese customers. They have very particular requirements. Um, we have people in Japan. We have people in Korea. I, I don't even count the number of nationalities at the company, the number of language groups. It's not uncommon to show up at a meeting at Intertrust and hold the meeting in French, for example. <laughs> um, it And that's one of the cool yeah. things, but that's also what makes us very flexible. And our yeah. customers are, are global. Yeah. So... Um, yeah. The business challenge for me personally, and it's something I really enjoy, is holding hands with this new industry that we're working in, which is one of the oldest industries in the world. I mean, there was no computers before electricity. And uh, so we, we we go back to the source. Yes. And then learning well, new cultures and all that stuff. It's fantastically fun. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like it's fun. And and you know, you're driven by a bigger purpose, right? So I think that is really probably the reason why you're able to mobilize you know your people because the purpose is there and like the the level of a challenge so that's that's ambitious that's great uh, and by the way in terms of the you know I've been in the energy industry for all my career so i know quite well how the executive think and what are you know the opportunities there so i'm sure that i think you are spot a great market potentially right now you know based on what you said i've only one question left about you as a leader as a ceo what is, in your experience, the biggest misconception about being a CEO in organizations? So, you know, people think a lot about, you know, what are the challenges that CEOs have every single day? And you, you know, you shed some light before in terms of what, you know, keep you awake at night. But what people don't really understand or they don't know about being a CEO, because it's not something that, you know, is always, you know, in the conversation, in the communications, in the media. What is the biggest misconception people have about being a CEO? I mean, no, not to be a smart ass, but I mean, you should ask <laughs> the people with the misconceptions. I mean, there's no one, there's no one size fits all. Um, yeah. I mean, there is, look, there's a psycho, forget CEO in any position. There's a psychology mm. that if you climb the tree, if you get the top branch, then your life is easy. And I think let's, let's call this the biggest misconception, right? Mm. Which your life gets harder as you climb the tree. If if you're an ethical, responsible person, yes, yes, then then easier. Now, you know, I know a lot of guys who crawl up into management positions who they treat people below them like cigarettes. They smoke them, they throw them away. Mm. I mean, that's disgusting. Mm. Those mm. people don't deserve to work, right? And you you don't have respect for humans. The humans who are helping you become successful, then you should not be working. You should not be around other humans. You're an animal. And to be uh, fair, in technology, we have seen these leaders, especially in the last oh, no, no, two, no, one or two years, right? Absolutely. I'm not saying they're just technology. I'm just saying we have some, unfortunately. No, know, no, 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 com example, no com right. com completely. But by the way, I would caution against the stereotypes because yes, uh, I mean, there's, true. there are these people who are you know, basically big time, ruthless assholes. But yeah, yes, the guys I know who sort of fit that category, and I'm not going to name names, but these are the famous people that you read about in the newspaper. They typically have a core team around them that help them get their stuff done that they're extremely loyal to who really mm. understand mm. um it i've never really met a successful leader who got there all by himself who just used people yes to get to where they're going those types of guys or women they end up with getting a grenade thrown in their tent right because you know they suck but you know the people who now the metrics for how you reciprocate collaborators and loyalty and stuff change from person to person, from team to team. You know, I've seen teams where, you know, 
people you know are they they drink blood right that that's just the nature of you know mm. yeah some people yeah. are driven Depends by aggression and competition i've seen teams where you know, we're somewhere in the middle of the spectrum right i've seen teams where everybody's touchy feely and they don't say bad words to each other and they start crying and it's like that's not us you know but um <laughs> We're not we're not sort of one of these touchy feely sort of organizations, but we're nothing like you know Elon Musk's team or nothing yeah. like. Um, I mean, there's there's another archetype. I'm not talking. I'm not really answering the question. So the, the other archetype is the Steve Jobs archetype, right? Where the leader is this godlike person, and you know that that's not us. Um, those people are very few and far apart, and. You know, aside from Jobs and Apple, I've never really, really seen it. I've seen people try to approximate it, you know, but then they're exposed for who they are, like quickly in the story, right? But yeah, well, like, look, we have a lot of examples. I mean, there are there are examples of very egocentric leaders, right? They are they have become the hero, right? They want to be the hero in front of the masses. You know, Musk to some extent, with all incredible power and intelligence he has, and you know, for what we did, you know, it might be perceived as you know one of those leaders that you know he want to show up. You know, like is the one. Is I, the I, I don't know him personally, but my 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 read on Musk is very different. My read on Musk is. I mean, he said it himself that he has Asperger's and he, I think he relates to other people very differently than most, most other human beings. And I think he is very driven by the idea that's in his head and he's ruthless in the way he executes. Mm. He also has this unbelievable brain where he can, I mean, he can multitask. Like I've never seen a human being do what he does. I, I'm actually very adept at multitasking but this guy is unbelievable i mean if <laughs> i came to you in the year 2000 and said i want to start a car company you think i was crazy and then you want to set up a spaceship company you want to set up a you know every single thing he does is like he's breaking open industries that were open and closed in the industrial revolution it's just stunning but i, I think the way he does it is he's got hyper focus He's super efficient at these problem transformations into problems he can solve very quickly. And I also think he's very good at hiring people. Mm. Uh, and I mean, the one thing I, I really admire that he does is he leads from the front. You're not making enough Model 3s. He sets up a bed in the factory floor and he lives there until they get the production fixed correctly. He doesn't get on his private jet and you know go to his island in the Caribbean or any of this. It leaves the minions to do the work. He gets in there and does it himself. I mean, Jobs was known for this too. You, it, the ability to walk up to anyone in your building, ask them what they're doing. If they're stuck, zoom into a level of detail that can help them get their job done better, yes. is a true skill. Like for someone in this position, yeah. And uh, you know, yeah. ownership and involvement is a big deal. Yeah, and you know, and I think you you have explained or you have essentially highlight one of the most successful traits by the way of leaders right so you know i really like that you know the, the point that you made all right so conscious about the time and getting closer to the end of this conversation that was great by the way it went so quickly tell us so very three quick question for you with a quick answer as a reflection so if you think about you know looking back at your career what you what you have done right is there one thing among many others that you consider your biggest learning as a professional Maybe something around what you already sh shared with me, but can you can you maybe explain what you think is has been your major learning, you know, as a reflection I, of your past? I, I, I hate to disappoint you with in the last question with a non-answer, but I can't think of one thing. I mean, it, it's a continuum. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really what it comes down to. I, I guess if I have to reduce it to one thing, it's. And this is not a one size fits all answer. It's just for me and the company and the field we're in. I, I think, I guess that we're best suited at keeping a small team of highly accomplished, highly specialized people that are yeah. matched against a problem. And what I've learned, if you do that correctly, you can solve problems that are Agreed. larger than life. Agreed. Uh, but otherwise, it's just, I can't. Well, that is a big learning, by the way, right? because look. Yeah, yeah. I strongly believe that, you know, that, you know, I think there is a big misconception, by the way, when we talk about teams. 
So teams is considered sometimes more like a value. What is really not considered enough is actually team is a performance unit. It's yeah. a unit to actually achieve retro performance if done properly, if built properly, which is really the definition of high performance team. I, I fully agree with you. And I also don't see teams. I mean, I mean I've talked to people, people, teams, yeah, yeah. teams. So yeah, I, yeah. It, you probably more or less expected that when we started asking the questions, because part of this is you're expected to say this, but I, I mean, I mean it, I believe it. But the thing that's missing is tools. It's teams and tools. Mm. And if you look at the history of, you, know, you look at history, Every major paradigm shift in history where one empire was defeated by a very unlikely enemy was driven by the development of a new technology for weapons and a new set of tactics that the attacker didn't understand. Um, you know, Napoleon, for example, defeated like the great armies of Europe as he came into being through you know, all sorts of wacky weapons that they have, like lighter armor made out of aluminium, they attacking the enemy in certain points of the battlefield that you know, people never expected you to come from. The Battle of Agincourt, right, uh, where, you know, the English army was vastly outnumbered by the French army and they were going to get slaughtered, but they had these English, the the longbow, the, the arrows, right? The French didn't know how to deal with, so they were able to take out hundreds and of French troops in one volley of arrows and the French didn't have any defensive. The Romans with their formations and, and their shields, their discipline, yes. team and tools, right? And what I found is you, with a small, dedicated, brilliant team, if you give them the right tools and you transform the problem they're trying to solve, into something they're skilled at solving that other people haven't solved, you can you can change the world. And yeah. that's been the mission. Yeah, and to me, tools is also part of, for example, the work that I do with teams is giving the tools sometimes is helping them to change their mindset, right? It's not just tools, technical tools, but it's also giving them, empowering them to perform at, the, at their best, right? So that's essentially yeah. what part of the tool. So in, on the other hand, very, for a quick answer, is there anything that you would have done differently in your career if you think about Talal? I mean, when you look back, you have 2020 vision, right? So I can give you a million examples where if I had done this, it would have moved faster. But, you know, when you look forward, not backwards in time, I mean, you, you work with the information available to you and sometimes you have to toss a coin. Um, nice. So you know, would I have done things differently in any given situation? Yeah, of course. But did I know any better at the time when I was making the decision? No, I'm, I'm, and you know, when I, you know, when I'm bored and I'm staring out of the window of the airplane, thinking about these types of things, I go, well, what if I had done the following? And then you think of 20 things that could have gone wrong if you go down that path. And that's, that's a mistake. A lot of people make yes. because I mean, I, we can do another podcast on my <laughs> theory of education, but in school, we're taught for the most part that every problem has an answer. Because yeah. most people don't end up doing open scientific research. So all the homework you're given has an answer. Sometimes it's harder to solve the question than others. So people go into life with the misconception that everything in front of you has, you know, has an answer, which is why people get divorced, why companies fail, you know, why, you know, you stop talking to your family. I mean, life is mostly full of, there, there's, there's no perfect answer to most questions in life. So you, you have to pick the best of all options at any given point in time. One thing I do is I never make decisions by myself. I, I, there's a group of people I respect. I will shop my ideas to other people and I will often like do what they're telling me to do versus, you know, do it myself. I'm, I'm basically a filter. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't hold the key. I don't hold the truth. I don't own the truth. Yeah. That's uh, great. No one owns the truth. Right. So yeah, and you know what's cool about my colleagues is we've worked together for so long. We just sort of sit around and and sort of brainstorm how we get through a problem, and thank God we get through it, right? So yeah, that, that, that absolutely fair. That's great. Last question, then I'll let you go. Is very quickly, what's you what what is how is important for you learning? You said your learning is a continuous thing, right? You're learning every single day. So for you, what is learning? Is learning by reading? Is learning by experiencing? You know, is an experiential learning is more about. So what is your approach to learning? It's all of the above. Um, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to learn or what's like. But there's 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 uh, 
there's post facto and I don't know, the opposite of post facto, pre facto, I guess, learning, but um, the, you know, you learn from experience, right? And you learn from things that have happened and you, it's important to look back and say, okay, what went wrong? What should we have done better? So next time you see something that looks like it, um, you innovate. I mean, th there are classic techniques in actual machine learning where if you see a problem, you break it into two pieces, yeah. something you solved before where you have an answer, boom, you get it. And then the delta, which is the innovation, then you solve the innovation, you put the two solutions together. That's important to apply to anything. It's like you meet someone new in a new business challenge. How does this deal look like the last deal I looked at? What other deals have I done that look like this? And then why is it different? And yes. then you focus on why it's different. It makes your life easier. Um, you know, sometimes you just got to go on Google and read the <laughs> internet. Um, yeah. But, artificial but the one intelligence thing is also a tool today. Yeah, sorry, you were saying. But, but one thing I'd leave you with is, I mean, ultimately the best way to learn is from other people, right? So mm. you you know the saying, I mean, to really see far, you have to stand on the shoulder of giants. Yes. And, you know, I've been very, 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 very lucky in my life to have met some truly great people and some truly kind people who have mentored me and, and helped me really. I wouldn't be here today if I couldn't stand on these people's shoulders. Yes. Um, That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Talal, so thank you so much for being part of the show. So where people should go if they want to know a little bit more about you, your work, uh, Intertrust? I mean, I'm I'm available anywhere. I mean, people should write to me. <laughs> I, I hope they're not trying to, you know, like sell me services in Bosnia or washing <laughs> machines or something. But, you know, I love to talk. I love to meet new people. I, I'm reachable through the Intertrust website. I'm reachable via LinkedIn. Those, you know, I don't live in a cave. So I <laughs> love meeting people. We're always looking for bright people to join the team. We're obviously looking for companies to partner with as we prosecute yeah. both in energy. And we didn't talk about it, but we have some very exciting. Now I try to sell you something. We have some very exciting products in the Web3 space for not just media, but for physical objects. We, we're working with a guy who's making uh, luxury sneakers, um, both metaverse versions and physical versions. And they're unique and tagged and authenticatable right. with our technology. So we love to talk to people. We love to meet people. So Great. find me on the internet. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Talal. It's been an uh, amazing conversation. So I really thank you for your time and I appreciate that. This was wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Take care. <laughs>